Well, we have arrived. Revelation 7. Probably never thought we'd get there, but we are here. Revelation 7. Uh, we're actually going to go through uh, Revelation 8. We're actually going to deal with all of 7 today and part of 8. And so for next week, uh, we'll talk about the first four trumpets, but again, it's going to be one of those things I'm going to play by ear. Uh, when I had, you know, when we only had like three or four people in here at 9:45, we were thinking, hmm, we didn't know all you guys were going to show up because you're running late. <laughs> so, depending on what we see next week, is what we'll do. Uh, as always, if you've got an internet connection, you got YouTube, you can always catch up. Even if you don't feel like taking the 30, 40 minutes to watch the YouTube video, you can always go on that website that's on your email and download the notes just to scan through them. Okay. So, we got four angels in Revelation 7. After I saw this, I uh, saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. That's the north, south, east, and the west corners. That's, a, that's figurative. It's not literal. There are not four literal corners. Okay. Um, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow upon the earth or sea or any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun. So, he's coming from the east with the seal of a living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Okay. So, I want to say, uh, bring this to your attention, that chapter 7 is kind of like in the parentheses between 6, the last part of 6, and, and chapter 8. What happened at the last part of chapter 6? What happened? What's the sixth seal? That's a great earthquake. Great earthquake. Biggest earthquake that's ever existed. Chances are it throws the timing of the earth off. It speeds up the rotation. And we have seen three instances. We've seen three instances in, in the past 11 years where earthquakes have actually sped up the rotation of the earth. Uh, and one of the things that we didn't discuss, that David and I have discussed, that what this also could be is a pole shift. If you, if you watch any science stuff, you don't have to listen to prophecy stuff. You can hear the, the, the talking about the pole shifting, uh, the fact that the, the magnetic north is moving more and more. And the, those of us in the military, you, for, if you're not in the military this, or, or in navigation or anything like that, if you don't do anything with navigation, this probably means nothing to you. But for those of us in the military, that, that, that north pole, the magnetic north is always moving. And every year we get adjustments. And in the last 20 or 30 years, it has moved a lot more than it had in the last 200. It's on the move. I, David, do you remember how fast it's moving? It's a, it's a couple of miles a day or a mile a day or something like that. It's no, no, not a mile a day. It's like 20, 20 to 50 miles a year, actually. So it's not, in the past, it's kind of just been there. And now it's moving. And there's a lot of ideas of what a pole shift would do. Some people say it wouldn't do anything except for mess up the compasses. Uh, some people are, would say absolute cataclysm. Whether or not Revelation 6 is a pole shift, we have no way of knowing. We have no idea. All I know is that's the wrath of the Lamb, and I'm not here for the wrath. I'm not appointed to wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5 9 says, You are not appointed unto wrath, but to grace. Go ahead, David. There's two verses in Isaiah that go with that. And so the, the bottom line here is this, uh, what I find interesting, and I was thinking about this this week, what were the words of the people who were there? They were, they were doing what and saying what? When the earthquake hit, what are they doing and saying? They're hiding. They're hiding. They're saying what? They're hiding from God. They're hiding from God. And, and so... It leads me, I started thinking about that this week, and it leads repenting. me to, huh? They're not repenting. Well, they're not repenting, but in this day and age, the idea of God is so far removed from so many people's thinking 
that there seems to have been some kind of a shift because now everybody is going, they're, they're, they're protect us from this, the wrath of this God. So you think about that logically. How do we get from point A to point B? What happens? Because if that were to happen today, short of some kind of supernatural intervention, people would not be blaming it on God. You see what I'm trying to say? Because there's an agnostic culture in this world, especially like if you look at Europe and Asia and China, you know, most of Asia. There's billions of people who really don't have a concept of God. But yet they're they're afraid of him. Exactly. Well, the, the interesting thing to me, though, is, is there's a change in attitude. Now, it doesn't... It's not a good attitude. They don't all of a sudden repent, okay? But their attitude about the fact that there's a God has changed. He got their attention, all right? So I just wanted to say again that Revelation 7 is a parenthesis. It's, and you're going to see that in several of these chapters. They're kind of parentheses. They're stuck off as added information, additional information. Bless you. So now here are the, here's the deal. The four angels are intent on hurting the earth. But they're prevented from doing so until the evangelists are sealed. Now, here's the, here's the question. How long does that take? And the answer is, we don't know. But I do know this. It can't be long. Um, it can't be a very long time that there's no wind blowing on the earth. Now, that doesn't mean that if God wanted there to never be a breath of wind again, there, there just wouldn't be a breath of wind. But going back, remember it says these four angels are holding back the winds. They, it says do not hurt the earth, the trees, the sea until the sealing has been done. So when they hold these winds back, it, it's, it's, it's temporary. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, when the Lord says, when Israel becomes a nation among nations again, that generation shall not pass. Mm -hmm. So we see the Lord coming again. That's right. Well, uh, you know, when we, when we talk about, I, wanna, I wanted to, I, I mentioned this last week, that I was going to talk about the wind deal as a meteorologist. And this is the conclusion I've come to, that this period of time cannot be a long period of time. <laughs> Because if you stop all wind on the earth, there's nothing. That hurts the earth. It's going to hurt the earth. And, and here's why. So let's talk about this. If there's no wind, we already had one. Rudy said it. Uh, say it again. If there's no wind, what happens? What's the effect? There's no clouds. Okay. Not even movement of clouds. There are no clouds. Because a cloud is sustained by currents of moist warmer air going up into what we call the CCL, the con cloud condensation level. That's actually a meteorological term. And we as meteorologists calculate that looking at upper air diagrams. So what would a, cl a cloud would do if all of a sudden there's no wind, it would gradually evaporate because the, the exchange of moisture would occur. Okay, it would gradually, because a cloud is there because this dew point is closer together to the temperature than the surrounding air. So the clouds would disappear. There would be no rain anywhere. You need to know uh, meteorologically that every drop of rain that's ever happened comes because of wind. Not necessarily wind from left to right or, or right to left, but wind from below to up. Because that's what, you know, and it says no wind. It doesn't just say nor no north wind or no east wind. There's wind, you know, everybody heard of an updraft? You know, that's what a tornado is. That's what a thunderstorm is, is, is wind going up. And that's what hailstorm is, is the wind is going up at such a sufficient force and velocity to suspend blocks, uh, you know, little cubes of ice. And, and, and they do like this and it gets, they fall out and they get a little wet and then they get blown back up and they freeze and you do that. That's wind. Without wind, that doesn't happen. And that's the same way a, a, a water droplet, a raindrop is formed, is by that process. And if that process is not there, then they don't form. So what this means is for 
However long this period is, there is absolutely not one drop of rain on the earth. Whatever showers are there are going to get rained out immediately because there's no new influx of moist air. Uh, there's no change in the weather anywhere. There's no cold fronts, no warm fronts. You know, there's also, uh, there needs to be an exchange and mixing of gases. And so we would have problems with plant growth. The air would start to become real thin. It would be hard for us to breathe. That's because, right. Uh, you've got to diffuse, you know, there's a lot of the oxygen we breathe doesn't come from a that, That's a really good, I hadn't even thought about that. You know, uh, if there's... Wind, and if we just rely on diffusion, we're going to have concentrations of oxygen. In the forest. Where, where the big cities are like Houston. And, mm -hmm. and so the air is going to get real thin. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. It's just going to be, it'll be a lot more dramatic than just lack of rain. That's true. True. Well, uh, let, let me go back to that because that's a really good point, Mark, and I'm glad you said that. Uh, no cold fronts, no cyclones. If there's no wind, there's no hurricanes. There's, the ocean currents would stop if the winds stopped blowing for any length of time. And the ocean current collapsing would. Anybody seen The Day After Tomorrow? That crazy sci-fi wackadoodle movie? That is actually not... Now, the stuff that they produce with the, the giant hole, uh, you know, the big cycle, that's not, that's not true. But the actual fact that the, if the ocean current did collapse, what they call the, the cyclohaline layer, if it did collapse, the weather would be wackadoodle all over the earth. And so if that happened for any length of time, uh, you would have the ocean currents just going crazy weather the, the poles would get much colder because you wouldn't have warm air blending and the tropics would get much warmer uh, that is what a hurricane is by the way that's god's way of taking heat from the tropics and, and distributing it to the north but back to what mark's saying you know you're thinking about the not just the hydrological cycle but the the gas cycle um yeah the the trees they have to have CO2. And once they, if there's no wind, once they've exhausted their supply of CO2, then, you know, hey, you would thrive really well in a forest if you're uh, a mammal. But if, there, if you're in an area where there's not a lot of plants, eventually you'd use up your, your share of oxygen because there's no circulation. So bottom line is this cannot be a very long time. Otherwise, it would be, the earth would be hurt. And, and, and you know, Mark, now that you mention it, that may be why he said the trees. It would just be because it would hurt the trees. If, if there was no wind, they're going to use up all the CO2 in the area and then die. The wind also starts the seeds of the trees to regenerate. You know, I thought about that too. There would be no pollen. You know, the, the whole cycle of the earth would absolutely fall apart if you had a period of time without any wind. So it have an effect as well with the, with the earthquake that just happened? I'm talking here, and then a tsunami, like say an earthquake tsunami, then all of a sudden nothing moves. Right. And actually, that is the next point. We cool down right back Okay, so this is a judgment on, in and of itself because it gets people attention. Now, what Rudy just said is true. That's what I put on here. Put in the context of the previous cataclysm. You go from absolute upheaval to absolute dead calm. That's, now think about that. You, you go from, you know, hiding in a cave because mountains are moved out of their place. The whole earth swivels and sways like a drunkard, you know, out of Isaiah. And now it's nothing. It's, it's nothing normal. Because yeah, we've experienced calm days. You walk out in the morning in a winter time, and, and it's nice and it's still, but it doesn't stay that way. The and winds the the winds up there are moving. <clears throat> Once again, it's just a you know I think, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that that those three verses there because I think it's often in the whole grand scheme of prophecy, that's often overlooked. Okay, the winds don't blow, and then they'll also because you've got angels coming after this with the trumpet judgments and the sealing of the hundred forty-four thousand. But that, in and of itself, as a meteorologist, always got my attention. I was just—I look at that and go, I just can't even imagine the cataclysm that would cause if it's any length of time. But you know, putting it in context. Remember, we got to keep context when we study the scripture, and we got to think about what would this be like. You go from absolute upheaval and craziness, and Texas doesn't look like it used to, and Florida is now, you know, 
underneath the ocean and all of these things go on and now it's just dead calm. Yeah, Rudy. Just consider the idea of someone sitting on a house right after Hurricane Katrina. That probably would be like Yeah, and the stillness. Of, if you've ever been in a hurricane, it, it can get really still afterwards. It gets very hot and humid and oppressive, and there's meteorological reasons for that, actually. Uh, the only time that I can ever remember being in one that didn't happen was Hurricane Ike. We had a nice cold front come, thank the Lord, yeah. right after Ike uh, had an early season cold front. But by and large, you know, it goes from absolute craziness to absolute stillness, and it's an eerie stillness. Um, yes, sir. Uh, I'm with folks who are going to be scared and stuff. But we're to rejoice and be glad because the Lord said our redemption draw not. Right. Well, and, and you know what? I, I think our redemption by this point probably already happened. Okay. But I think it's interesting timing. Because now all of a sudden we have 144,000 evangelists. Yes. Yeah, my time. Be, you know. Yeah. Now, why why 12,000 from each tribe? Two bits Take a guess. <clears throat> and if you don't get this answer, it doesn't mean you're stupid. It doesn't. No. It, it's a hard answer to get. Huh? Huh? In in a way, it does. Yes. Rudy said it's something about going back to the book of Numbers. Okay, in a way it does. Part of the answer does, yes. I'll give you partial credit. Oh, just a random number. Boom! The what? Perfect. That's it. Just a random number. No. God is being literal here. That's the answer. Oh, thank you, Lord. Good job. It's, it's not just a random number. <laughs> okay, 144 is not just a random number. It's being, God's being literal. If he were to say 144,000 Jews, people would read all sorts of things into 144,000, like the Jehovah's Witnesses have. They got 144,000 until the 1920s, and then they got 145,000, and they're like, uh-oh, you got to come up with a different idea. All right? Now it's spiritual number. No, God's being literal. He's being literal. Very excellent, excellent. Uh, at some point in time, after these first six seals... There are 144,000 Jewish men who are virgins. They have not been defiled by women. That's what the scripture says. Revelation verse 14, I'm mean chapter 14, verses 3 to 5. We go back and look again, and they're supernaturally converted. All right? Do not, never underestimate the power of God to supernaturally convert somebody. It is happening today as we speak. At this moment, people are being supernaturally converted. Because they're having dreams about Jesus. Sorry, so you kind of, kind of get the idea that they may be um, young. And that's that's the idea that kind they're like, young. Kind of like the Apostle Paul. They're they're kind of like the Apostle Paul. They're kind of like Saul yeah. right now. They're these young, right. probably uh, Hasidic Orthodox Jews right. that. You know, they may have their yarmulkes on and their little locks, and they may be in New York, or they may be here, they may be there. Somehow, some way, God is going to supernaturally convert them. And it's after all of this other stuff has happened. Okay? Now, a quick review, the 12 tribes. So, remember, we have Jacob, and he wants uh, Rachel, but he gets stuck with Leah. And then he works another seven years and gets Rachel. But uh, Leah gives him Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Well, Rachel says, I can't have kids. So he, she gives Bilhah to Jacob. And from Bilhah, he gets Dan and Naphtali. Well, then Leah says, well, I can do that too. And gives, <laughs> gives him Zilpah, her handmaiden. Uh, and he gets Gad and Asher. And then Rachel says, Ooh, I got one. Joseph. And then Leah says, Ooh, I got two more. Issachar and Zebulon. And then finally, he gets Benjamin from Rachel. And what happens to Rachel when Benjamin's yes. born? She dies. And then we get Manasseh and Ephraim from Joseph. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you three lists. This is the reason why you have handouts, because... Uh, if you did not have handouts, then you would be trying to write all this down, and it would just be a fail. So, 
Here are the 144,000. You need to know, and it's important to know this, that the 144,000 that are in Revelation are not the same, same ones listed in Genesis and not the same ones in the tribe that inherited the land in the book of Numbers. In the book of Numbers, remember our study in Numbers, where we saw the camps of Israel laid out like a cross, and, and Judah's over here in the east, and these guys in Judah represents the, the man, and these, these group of tribes represented the ox, and this group of tribes represented the eagle, and, and, and so we, that's the four living creatures that we see in Revelation 4. So, here's the Genesis group, all right? Now, in the inheritance, what happens here with Levi? Okay, but do they have an inheritance? No. no, they do not have an inheritance. They're given cities. All right, but they do not have an inheritance in the land. So in order to offset that, Joseph is divided into two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. All right? And then we've got Dan. Now, when we look at the Revelation 7 list, most of these guys are the same. The same, the same, the same. Manasseh's here, Ephraim's gone, but guess what? Levi's got his inheritance back. So why are Dan and Ephraim missing? Why are they omitted? What did they do where they are no longer being used by God? This cause for this 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 is why you have to know your Old Testament. This is why this is important and why every little story is important. Every little verse. I'll give you a hint. It was after Solomon died and Jeroboam split it with Rehoboam. Rehoboam got prideful and he said, hey, what am I going to do with these guys? And the old men said, hey, treat them like brothers and blah, blah, blah. And the young, the young guys said, ah, tell them, you know, my father beat you with whips. I'm going to beat you with scorpions. And that, I don't know, you're not. And then they split. And what did Jeroboam do? Set up two high places. Say it. Preach it. He set up two high places. He said, and where did he set them up? At Bethel and Dan. At Bethel and Dan. And where is Bethel? Ephraim. And there it is. King took counsel and made two calves of gold. Because this is what he said. This is what Jeroboam was worried about. I don't want them going down to Jerusalem. Or going up to Jerusalem, technically. Because they're going to realize how much they're going to miss going up there. And they're going to want to join back with them. And I like being a king. And I don't want to be under Rehoboam. So he said, I'm going to, I'm going to wreck too. And guess what? We're going to make it super easy for you guys. We, we got some up here in Dan. Remember, Dan started off near where Gaza is today. And he didn't like it. The tribe of Dan didn't like it. Too many bad people. They didn't like the Philistines. So they moved up to where Lebanon is, near where Lebanon is today. All right, to the northern part. That's where Jesus was in Caesarea Philippi when he said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not stand against it. The gates of hell, that portal that the ancients thought led to hell, was in Dan, in the northern kingdom. So, you have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, brought you out of the land. And he set one in Bethel and put the other in Dan. All right? Hosea, like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture? Ephraim is joined to idols. This is interesting. Leave him alone. So, There's always a reason for everything. You just got to find it. Leave him alone, he says. So, we're going to look at the scene around the throne real quick. Revelation 7, 9 through 17. I'm not going to read it all. Um, but there's a great multitude everywhere. There's angels. We have the elders. The four living creatures. Okay? Now, and we have this group called the multitude. There's a multitude of people. A great multitude. Now they are martyrs from the great tribulation. Alright, now this is interesting. Who was I talking to about this last week? Go ahead, brother. I, I thought the martyrs were under the altar to the end of the tribulation. 
There are. Well, that's a good question. And that's one of those things that, you know, we don't have a firm answer on. You know, um, but we do know these guys are from Great Tribulation. Now, I was having a conversation with the, was it you, Rudy? It was you. Um, they don't hunger any longer. They're no longer thirsty. The sun will not strike them, nor they will be scorched by heat. They were, they were, say it again so everybody can. They were beaten and worn out. See, you need to realize, and we need to realize, that just because we are believers does not mean that we will not face hardship. Anybody who believes uh, that you know being, being a Christian automatically prevents you from, from having hardship, I, all I know is this. There's a lot of Christians... Yeah better Christians than I that, that not just die because of their faith but have starved to death in Africa and as far as I know there has been no manna come from heaven okay there are Ethiopian Christians back in the 80's when that crisis was going on and now Christians in Sudan who are starving to death and their, their faith is much greater than mine they're starving to death manna has yet to fall for them I can't explain that. All I know is God's will is perfect. Look at the ones in China. They crucified them. Mm -hmm. so. And they're, they're crucifying them in Syria. Yeah. <laughs> so, all I know is that these guys in the Great Tribulation, because here's one of the, here's, and I say this because one of the aspects of the post-trib rapture people, people who are post-trib, one of the things they will say is that you are protected through that's that God doesn't take you out but doesn't protect you by taking you out that he protects you supernaturally through like you know Noah in the ark and yet I see a whole bunch of people here who were hungry and thirsty the sun was striking them something's going on supernatural with the judgments that's right multitude now this is interesting God will wipe away every tear from their eye. Hasn't yet, though. Now, as Rudy is, is finding out, as he's now getting into the Greek, finally after about a year of prodding him to do it, he's finally getting into it. When you get into the Greek and you realize that even the, the, the tenses of the verbs are extremely important. Am I right, brother? Mm -hmm. I mean, the mood that it's in, the voice that it's in, the tense that it's in, all the other little crazy things that it's in, everything means something. I guess so. I don't know Japanese. <laughs> but it says God will wipe away the tears. It doesn't say he has or he did. So what you need to know is there's a bunch of martyrs up in heaven with tears still in their eyes. Now, Revelation 21 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. This is another instance of this is the millennial kingdom. So the millennial kingdom is when the tears stop. And according to these verses, I'm not so sure there's not tears in heaven. I mean, if you can if you can show me a verse that says there's no crying in heaven before Revelation 21, 4, I would like to see it. Because all I know is what Revelation uh, 7, 14 says. He's going to do it. It's a promise. But if something's a promise that he's going to do, it means he hadn't done it yet. Yeah. When all those folks go before the great white throne, there's going to be tears. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's right. That's right. So, the seventh seal. Uh, when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there's silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. Now, y'all all heard my joke about this. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. What are you pointing <laughs> to my wife? <laughs> yeah. Everybody know the joke about this? That this verse proves that men are raptured 30 minutes before women? Yeah. Because it's quiet. Because you get 30 minutes apiece? <laughs> 
So, uh, basically, this is speaking to the severity of what's going on. Everyone is speechless. They, when they see this angel open the seventh seal and they know what's coming next, everybody's just flabbergasted. They can't talk. They're beyond words. And it takes them 30 minutes. Now, you, you know, you think about it. Heaven is a place of singing. It's a constant place of worship. But this severity of judgment that's coming even causes the angels to stop singing. That's got to be... Talk, you know, we talk about awkward silences. That's got to be some awkward silence. So, the seventh seal leads to the seven trumpets. And when I saw the seven angels who stand before God, the seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with the golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God. Remember, everything that happened in the Old Testament, the, the, the waving of the censer, all of that stuff is symbolic of heaven. When you look at, let me give you a, a, a as we get into the new year, everybody's going to make a, a, you know, I'm going to read my Bible through this year, this time finally. Everybody's going to do that, and then, you know, hopefully you'll do it, and not by February stop. Because what's going to happen is you're going to get into Deuteronomy and Numbers and Leviticus, and you're going to want to pull whatever hair you have left out, and you're going to go, what is it? Let me give you uh, something to help you make it through. Remember that the tabernacle and the temple is what's in heaven. So remember when you're reading things that seem, oh, he's got 200 engraved pomegranates, and they're on the door facing, and you've got a uh, wash basin that's, that's 20,000, you know, gallons because you know, it's 6,000 baths and it's got four, you know, 12 bulls. And remember that this is all symbolic of things that are in heaven. Okay, so that's your challenge. Uh, then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire and the altar and from the altar and he threw it on the earth and there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashings, lightning, and an earthquake. All right. So now we go from absolute chaos with an earthquake to absolute silence and stillness with no wind, ceiling of 144,000, and now we're back to thunder and rumbling and lightning and another earthquake. How maddening. So I wanted to talk about these seven angels. Uh, we need to know that apocryphal literature you know, everybody knows the Apocrypha. If you, if you, you know, we do not have it as canon scripture as Protestants. The Catholic Church does have it. But we need to be aware that there is some really good stuff in there. Just because it's not scripture, God-inspired, doesn't mean that there's nothing to be found in there. Matter of fact, one of the biggest Apocryphal books is the book of Enoch, which is mentioned by Jude. Has not Enoch said the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints? So the apostle Jude, the writer Jude, is quoting the apocryphal book Enoch, which always lends credence to me, but the problem is with Enoch, you can't trust that it's still the same. It hasn't been carried through. But it's very interesting reading. I thought for a long time, when I first read it, thirty something years ago. I, I thought Gabriel had one of the best testimonies I ever heard. I stand in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's good. Well, you know what's interesting is here's here's in Tobit in the book. It's an apocryphal book. We read Tobit. Uh, it says, "I am Raphael, one of the seven holy angels, which presents the prayers of the saints, which go out in in before the glory of the Holy One." And then you you much you mentioned Luke one nineteen. I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. Okay, so we know that there's seven angels, and one of them's name is Raphael, we think. One of them's name is Gabriel. Now we got five others, but we don't know. Then you got Michael, he says, oh, and, and Michael? I fight for the children of Israel. Michael the fights for Israel. As long as I'm God, Jacob shall not perish. That's right. So, I want to I want to talk real quick about this other angel. It says there's another angel. He's the one that throws the the, the censer. 
Now, some people will say this is Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you that it's not. It's not Jesus Christ. And here's the reason. Because we get into the Greek. And you can see right here, there are two words for another in Greek. Now, in English, if I say, uh, let's see, Andrew, give me another pencil. Do you know if, if I have a pencil... And if I say, Andrew, give me another pencil. Let's say I have a, a red, num a, a number two, a yellow number two pencil that we all grew up with, right? And I say, Andrew, give me another pencil. He does not know if I just need a pencil or do I need another number two pencil. He, he may give me a, a mechanical pencil and I'm fine with that. Or I may need, I may be taking a Scantron test and need a number two, Right? In the Greek, it doesn't have that problem. There's two different words that mean another. One is alos, which means another of a different type. And another, the other word is heteros, which means another of the same type. So the, the word used here is heteros. And why, why that's important is because it means that this angel is like the seventh. If this angel was alos, another another type of angel, then we might could say it might be Jesus. It might be metaphorically describing Jesus, but we know that that's not true because it's saying they're the same. This angel is the exact same as these other seven guys. So I just wanted to kind of sidebar that to once again show you how important it is to look, especially when you're really trying to figure something out, to look at the source material. So, he said, cast it on the earth. Now these are the prayers of judgment. Remember back in verse six, uh, 10 of chapter 6? Remember what those guys under the altar were saying? Hey, Lord, how long? Well, their prayers have been going up from under the altar, have been going up as a, to the censer as a, a sweet-smelling offering. Okay? As censer smoke. Now, those prayers are being answered. They've thrown them down. And there's a result. We have peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So, we have a great pause, and now it's over. The pause is over. Uh, so we go from a great earthquake to a dead calm, to thunder and lightning and another earthquake. And now we head into the trumpet judgments. And another name for the trumpet judgments is the judgment of thirds. So as you, the judgment of thirds, because you're going to see a third part of this and a third part of that taken out. It's truly a cataclysmic time. Um, any questions, any discussions about this? So real quick review. Why is Dan not allowed to be one of the witnesses? Okay, but let's, let's simplify it. Idolatry. You need to know that idolatry has permanent consequences. Okay, this idolatry of Dan happened in around 850, 900 B.C. And here 3,000 years later almost, it still has consequences. Uh, who are the ten? Who are the? I want to discuss this real quick too. The ten lost tribes. We always hear that we have ten lost tribes. Uh, that those are the bless you. Those are the tribes in in, in Israel. I don't think so. Uh, I believe that first of all, if there are lost, they're really not lost because um, God knows who they are. But I believe that you've got yeah. Exactly. But also what happened too was a whole bunch of those ten tribes before the, they were carried off in a Syrian invasion, a whole bunch of them lived in, in Benjamin and Judah. And Simeon, I think, is the other one. So there's a lot of intermarrying in the tribes. Uh, we kind of see it in this kind You say you're, a, you're American, but your ancestry may be from Mexico, it may be from Ireland, it may be from Greece. You know, just because, I mean, I would think that if you, 
If you were to ask somebody would ask you who you are, you would say I'm an American. But if they were to know what nationality, your first thing you're going to pop off is Greek. I'm Greek because that's how they are. They're very prideful. <laughs> she just doesn't use Windex on everything. <laughs> <coughs> Or eat, anyway. eat lamb. I've never met a Greek that doesn't like lamb. It just boggles my mind. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that, that's a very, I think, you know, God is very specific. I'm proud of Michelle for getting that. That was a hard one because it, it, it really is. It's not a random number. There's 144,000 people out there. One day, God will supernaturally convert them. They'll instantly know what tribe they're from. And they'll go, yeah, I'm, that, I'm, I'm from Reuben. And I think that they'll probably are doing that because they're probably going to have specific mission fields. You know, depending on where the tribe of Reuben, Reuben ended up, where the tribe of Levi ended up. Where did they all end up? We don't know. Um, I know Jonathan Furness is finding a lot of them and And food... Project DNA and stuff like that, we see, you know, mitochondrial DNA, we see a lot of that too. So, very interesting stuff. So, hey, we're actually going to get out of time. It's crazy. It's freaky. All right, let's pray. Father, we just, uh, once again, Lord, we're, we sit there and we look at your word and realize how how marvelous it is and how every every little fragment of a sentence is important. Father, we look back at the book of Hosea where you said leave him alone and, and we realize the, the implications of that but Father most importantly Lord I pray that as we look at especially uh, Dan, Dan and Ephraim Lord that we realize Father the consequences of sin Lord not only the consequences of sin in our personal lives but the consequences of sin for future generations so, Father, may we always do your will. May we always follow after you. And may we always put our trust and faith in you. Lord, as we all go our separate ways and, and uh, for Christmas and the new year, Lord, I pray that you would just protect us, keep us safe. And above all, Father, help us to be a witness. Help us to never forget we're your ambassadors, that we are on a mission to tell the world about you. May we not bring disgrace to your name by our actions or our thoughts or our words this Christmas season, but may we always point to your glory and your grace and your mercy. In Christ's name.